I think we go, I'll go till I'm done with Sunday school. And then if we have a longer break than, than typical, because I think pastor's been going a little bit long lately, but uh, let's, let's open in a quick word of prayer. I just want to pray real quick to get the Lord's mind again. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, thank you and praise you, Lord, for another day that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for getting us all out here safely. Lord, thank you for just the opportunity to, to be here, to gather in your name and to be able to teach and to preach, Lord. I pray that you'd hide me in the shadow of thy cross, Lord God. Help me to be um, humble, Lord, and just uh, meek, Lord, and just uh, filled with thy spirit and led of thee. I pray, God, you'd forgive me for any sins that I've committed, Lord. And those in the congregation, Lord God, clean us up this morning. I pray you'd wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Let everything be done this morning to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Okay, um, my Sunday school for this morning is a little bit of a continuation of what pastor had begun. So pastor uh, several weeks ago and for the past several Sunday schools has been working through the Holy Week. So Palm Sunday and then into Easter Sunday. And then he continued right on into uh, the Ascension and then 40 days, or I'm sorry, the resurrection and then 40 days after the Ascension of Christ. And then just last week he finished up with, uh, with Pentecost and I asked Pastor, I said, so what's, what's the next uh, event on the calendar? And he said, well, I guess between Pentecost and now we're looking for the rapture. And I says, okay, so, I, so on Pentecost, again, 50 days after the resurrection, the Holy Ghost was given. And I wanted to get a little bit more into the Holy Ghost because I, I picked up this book some time ago and I started reading it. And uh, Tommy would appreciate this because it's Charles Haddon Spurgeon but it's Holy Spirit power. And um, I did a study on the Holy Ghost yesterday and the day before, and that's what I prepared for this morning. So hopefully uh, everybody's comfortable this morning and uh, ready to, to listen to a Sunday school message. Um, well, I'll try to keep it a little bit interactive. I like to ask questions and stuff too, just to keep uh, people engaged. And I think it's, it's better that way. Um, but again, I say, I hope everybody's comfortable this morning. And I say that with purpose and intent because we're going to get into the, the comforter here in a little bit. Okay, so to start, if we could look in 1 John in chapter 5, I want to look at the Godhead again. Uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, and we'll read about God and the Godhead. And we know that God is one God, and this is the part where we read and we try to figure it out, and we think about God, and we go, he's, he's one God, but he's three um, persons or entities that are in our aspects, you could say, of one entity. Uh, and it, it sometimes you, you get confused there. I was looking at a uh, King James doctrinal debate group, and they were discussing the Ancient of Days. And they were saying, who is the Ancient of Days? And in one case, it, they, they proved through Scripture that the Ancient of Days is God the Father. But in that same thread, and as you read down, there was another person that was that was uh, inserting verses and, and interjecting comments to prove that the Ancient of Days is actually, in fact, Jesus Christ. And as you go through there, you see it both ways. And the conclusion was, which there didn't really end up being that definitive of a conclusion, was that in some cases and in this passage, it definitely is referring to God the Father, the Ancient of Days. But when you look here and you read these passages in reference to the Ancient of Days, it's definitely referring to Jesus Christ as judge. So it's like, which is it? Well, it's, is it God the Father? Yes. Is it Jesus Christ? Yes. Is it both? Yes. And it's one of those things where you sit there and you start scratching your head and you're going, how does this all work? Because one like unto the Son of Man came to the throne whereon sat the Ancient of Days. So you have these two different beings interacting amongst themselves, and yet it's the Godhead. Okay. And again, it's at, it's at that point you start to just scratch your head and, and blow a gasket and say, I can't, I can't get this. And it's a mystery. The Godhead is very complex. So to oversimplify it is not my intent here, but where the scriptures makes a distinction and where the scriptures um, segment out and separate those entities, we follow suit and say, this is what the scripture says. And so 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, concerning the Godhead, the Bible says here, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one, okay? So when you think about the Holy Ghost, and the Bible 
The Bible here um, refers to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Ghost. In other passages, you'll see the Holy Spirit. And again, as we continue through the study, you'll see the, the Holy Spirit referred to as the Comforter, um, all, all the same uh, entity. We're talking about the same Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, um, referred to and called by different names in, in different occasions. Uh, but just to, to show that and to demonstrate that real quickly, uh, we want to look at the Holy Ghost in Luke chapter 4. We're going to look at just two quick passages in Luke, where in one passage they're referring to the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost, and in one passage they're referring to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit, and you'll see where I'm going with that. So Luke chapter 4, let's look real quick, and we'll just lay some groundwork here, and then we'll jump right into uh, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, what He does for us, uh, how He helps us, and, um, and, and who, who He is. Okay, so Luke chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Okay, so in one passage you see that Jesus Christ was full of the Holy Ghost, and being full of the Holy Ghost, he was led by the Spirit, same being, into the wilderness. Okay, just a couple more chapters over in Luke chapter 11. Again, we'll look at just a few scriptures, and then we'll get into the, to the meat of this, but I want to lay some groundwork here. Luke chapter 11 and verse 13. The Bible says here, if, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Okay, so I think about, um, you know, it's, it's the whole supermarket analogy. It's the whole... Any, any store that you go to analogy where you can't, you can't go into a place without somebody asking for something, right? They want something. And, and sometimes, you know, a parent will give in and they'll say, okay, fine, let's you know, just get them this so they stop and be quiet. And other times it's you, you try to fight that battle and you have to kind of pick and choose when you want to fight that battle. But even as a, a, as a sinful man, as, as, as a human man, you know, fathers know how to give good gifts to their children. Um, and I, I, I'd like to think that um, on some occasions I've given my kids good gifts and they've really appreciated them. But what the scriptures are saying here is that, you know, how much more is your heavenly father willing to give the Holy Spirit unto them that ask for him? So, you know, we should ask for the Holy Spirit and in our prayers and in interaction with God, ask, Lord, give me more of, of thy spirit. Please fill me with thy spirit because I don't want to get up even um, today as an example and in my own strength or in my own ability, try to, to preach or teach a Sunday school lesson or preach a message in the morning service. Uh, it would be a flop. You guys don't want to hear from me. You want to hear what the Lord has given me. So again, ask God, I, can you give me your Holy Spirit? Can you lead me? Help me to have clear thoughts and to establish my thoughts so that I don't wander down some rabbit track and get, get the congregation lost and it turns out not to be a blessing. Okay, so the Holy Spirit. Um, one last passage, John chapter 7, John chapter 7, and we'll look in verse 39. Here again, we have a passage that's referring to the Holy Spirit. It says, but this, he, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet given glorified okay so the spirit was who he spake of and then it says goes on to say the holy spirit was not yet given so we understand that that's that's the same all right so if i use those um, terms interchangeably understand i'm re we're referring to the same spirit of god the holy spirit uh the holy ghost okay so when we think about the holy spirit and pastor did a good teaching on this one time and when he was witnessing to miranda's uncle at a funeral service he brought up the ministries of the Godhead. And as he laid out the ministries of the Godhead and how God has interacted with man throughout the course of history, um, he, he was trying to illustrate how that God essentially is a Godhead. He's a, he's a trinity. He's a triune being because Miranda's family is, is uh, Jehovah's Witness. And so they reject the notion that, that Jesus Christ is God. Okay, so, so Pastor, in his wisdom, as he's witnessing to her uncle, tried to get into the ministries of the Godhead. And he, he talked about how in the Old Testament, how God the Father was the primary instrument and it was his ministry 
how he was interacting with the nation of Israel. And through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he interacted with the nation of Israel and brought them along. And it was God the Father's ministry to the nation of Israel. God actually, it says in, in, in the scriptures that he was at, at one point married to the nation of Israel and he wrote them a bill of divorcement because they, they had played the harlot and they had corrupted their ways and they had rejected God and basically turned to idols and, and pushed away uh, God the Father, okay? So the Old Testament, and when you think about the ministry of the, of the Godhead, it was the Father dealing with the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. Now, is that to say that, that Jesus Christ or that God the Son did not have involvement in the Old Testament? Absolutely not. I mean, we know that to be the case. We know that um, the angel of the Lord manifesting itself as the pre-incarnate Christ interacted with the, the nation of Israel. But when we speak primarily, it was God the Father. Does that mean that the Holy Spirit was not involved in the Old Testament? Again, no, right? That for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, okay? So again, it gets a little bit confusing, but when you think about it in that light, Old Testament interaction with the Godhead and to mankind was the Father dealing with the nation of Israel. When Christ came, when Christ came and, and, and the New Testament as we were transitioning from the old to the new, and Jesus Christ came, who was his ministry to? Who was Jesus Christ's ministry to when he came? He came to the Jew. The scriptures say he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Okay, so Jesus Christ came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He didn't come to the Gentile. In fact, you read in, in the scriptures and, and in the gospels in particular where Christ basically called the Gentiles dogs still. And the Gentiles recognized themselves as such, that they were dogs and they fed from the crumbs of their master's table, right? And so Jesus Christ, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. And the scriptures go on to say, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. And that's what we are. We're the sons of God through faith in Christ. So so Jesus, again, he came and he came to minister to the house of Israel. Again, they rejected, you stiff-necked, right? Uh, they, they, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. You do always resist what God has offered for you. So he kind of turned and the church began at Pentecost. And that's where pastor left off last Sunday. The Holy Ghost was given, the church of God started, and it was made up of a body of believers who were formerly either Jew or Gentile, but essentially lost their identity as such and became the church of God in Christ. So you have the Jew, the Gentile, the church of God. We understand that. Um, but when you get saved, you no longer identify as a Jew. You no longer identify as a Gentile. You are now a member of the church of God. As Pastor Jim would say, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. You're something totally new. And, and Pastor Jim really um, loved that verse and expounded on that in such a way that to describe that, that a man or a woman who becomes saved truly is a new creature uh, and, and a unique creature, one that will never die. You'll live forever. You have everlasting life. You become a, a, son, of, a son or a daughter of God, um, an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. So all of those things. But the Holy Ghost's ministry now is to the church, to the body of believers. So as he, as he broke that apart and kind of um, went through the ministries of the Godhead, it kind of demonstrated to her uncle that maybe there is more to this Christ and the Holy Ghost and, and God the Father. And he kind of showed that, um, that in fact, Jesus, Jesus was God. And that was, that was where he, and he almost got saved, by the way, that, that night, um, but he didn't. So anyway, the comforter, let's move on to the comforter. The comforter, do we live in comfort? Who slept in a comfortable bed last night? That's why I asked this morning, I said, I hope everybody is comfortable in here this morning. You know, when we think about the comforts that we have here in this country and just as Americans, uh, we are incredibly blessed. And we take, I think, so sometimes for granted how comfortable we have it. And to a certain extent, with comfort, sometimes can come idleness, right? Because you get so content, you don't want to, make waves, you just get comfortable. Uh, that's why at times it's difficult to, um, you, you know, you might hate your job, 
and I hate my job and I, I just, I can't see myself doing this for the next 15 or 20 years. I just, I can't do it. But you say, how can I step out of my comfort zone, right? And, and, and explore a new endeavor or to start, start afresh or start anew. Uh, and you have a resistance to do that. Um, human beings are creatures of habit, right? You, you come to church and for the most part, you park in the exact same spot that you parked in last time, if it's available. When you come into the church, you sit in the exact same seats that you sat in last time, right? We like to be comfortable and not, not make waves and, and, and stir the pot too much. So we live in comfort. You know, we have comfortable beds. We have comfortable homes. We have comforters on our beds, right, that we cuddle up in and wrap up and, and, and stay warm. Uh, comfortable pajamas, right? You get in your little comfy, you leave church and you get out of your suit and tie and, and you put on something more comfortable, right? You put on sweatpants or, or, or shorts or something. If, well, I don't know about today. I think today's not gonna be warm enough for shorts. Um, when I think of comfort, a couple of things that come to mind is uh, a mother comforting her child when they're hurt or maybe they have a nightmare and they come down and they crawl in, into bed with you and, and mom will grab that child and will comfort them. That's what the Holy Ghost does to us as, as believers. He comforts us. Uh, he, he wraps his arms around us and embraces us and speaks comfortably to us and tenderly. Uh, another, another example that I thought of is a pet. So some of us have pets that are scared of thunderstorms. And when a storm comes, your dog begins to tremble and it gets concerned about the storm and thinks, you know, oh no, what's going to happen here? And we, we tend to think, well, nothing's going to happen. It's just another thunderstorm coming through. And so you grab your dog and you pet your dog and it's okay. Don't worry. It's okay. You comfort your dog. Uh, how about food? Can food comfort you? And I wish Tommy was here right now because Tommy be amen in that. Food can be a, a comfort. They call it comfort food, don't they? With it, you know, when you get a, a big, you know, maybe plate of uh, fettuccine Alfredo from Olive Garden yesterday and high calorie and you eat that and it just fills you up and it's like, oh, it's, it's comforting. Does the scriptures bear that out about comfort food? So, turn to Song of Solomon real quick. I want to show you a verse here that, that caught my attention yesterday as I was searching for comfort in my uh, concordance, Song of Solomon, chapter two. Oh, Song of Solomon, chapter two, in verse five. It says here in, in Song of Solomon, chapter two, in verse five, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. And I read that verse and I said, comfort me with apples. I said, that, that, when I think of comfort food, apples is not the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> to, to me, right? I think of a big, thick filet mignon, you know, steak that you can cut up and, and sink your teeth in. I think of uh, Yolanda's gnocchis and hot sausage or maybe their coconut cream pie or uh, banana Foster's cheesecake from the Carlton that I used to work at. Coffee is a comfort, right? I, we got our coffee and it comforts us and it wakes us up and don't, don't talk to me. Don't come to me before I have my coffee. You know, there's little mugs that say that, um, you know, food and, and drink can be comforting. You think of the wrong types of food and drink, or maybe taking it to, to an extreme with, with food. Um, my mind goes back to a, a story. Uh, and this was like, I can't remember. It was one of those, um, not, not Dr. Phil, but was one of those daytime people from back in the day. I can't even remember who it was. It might have been Phil Donahue. But this, this child uh, was overweight and was getting bullied at school. And when he would come home from school and tell his mother, they're picking on me, that, you know, they're picking on me for my weight. And she would say, here, I baked a, a chocolate cake. Here, have a piece of chocolate cake and console yourself. And she was kind of contributing to the problem because she was feeding this child uh, too much. And, and it, you know, it, was, it was a bad situation. But food can comfort people, but in, in such a manner that's not, it's not good. How about the bottle? People find comfort in the bottle and they drink their sorrows away. And ultimately we know there is no true or lasting comfort in those things, but the Holy Spirit gives us comfort that is true and that is lasting and that continues. 
um, sometimes just amongst ourselves. We come to church and the Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens. And if you're going through a difficult time and you're struggling with something, friends and, and brethren, uh, fellow saints can be a comfort to you. You can tell your problems to them. And sometimes they've experienced something very similar. And, and pastor has said that, you know, he has thyroid disease and there are others in the church that have that. And there are people who have maybe lost a, a parent or a son or a daughter or something, and they can relate to somebody else and they can offer comfort and assistance to somebody because they understand they've been through that. And God sometimes will allow those types of instances to happen in your life because he wants you to be able to assist others and to be able to offer that, that comfort. Um, Job had some friends like that that came to comfort him. And what did Job think of those folks as comforters? What did he say? He said, miserable comforters are you all, right? He, he didn't appreciate their type of, uh, of consolation. Uh, fortunately, in, in this church, we don't have those types of, um, of comforters that, that Job had and his friends. Um, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter one. Let's take a quick look there. Second Corinthians one, and then again we'll we'll get into the the Holy Ghost. I'm I'm still kind of just laying some some groundwork here and keeping it somewhat light. But uh, if uh, and as you're turning to Second Corinthians chapter one, I'm just going to read a, a passage here from James that I have listed here in my notes. Uh, you don't have to turn here, but find Second Corinthians one. And I'm going to read James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. It says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Right? So if someone comes to you and they have a need and they're looking for some assistance or some comfort or for their burden to be borne by you or, or, or to, you know, for you to help them out with, with such a thing. And you have what they need and you say, go, you know, be, come again tomorrow, come again tomorrow when it's a more convenient time for me or something like that. When you have this stuff right by you, it's, it's, it's vain. It's like Paul talks about uh, sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. If you don't have charity with your, with your work and with your faith, um, then it's dead, it's vain. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, when we, re we read about the comfort that we have in Christ, it says in verse um, 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort. I like that. Who comforteth, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. And so it works like that. God allows tribulation in our life and trials in our life and, and tests. And through it all, um, as, we, our, as our faith stands firm and as we trust God, God comforts us in those tribulations. And then the comfort wherewith we are comforted, we are able to offer to others who are going through those same types of situations. And so it all works together for good to the God of all comfort, right? He, he, he makes us better as we, uh, as we work through that and come out on the other end. Talk about, you know, the rapture. We say after, after Pentecost and of the giving of, of the Holy Spirit, nothing really happens in, the, in God's timeline until the rapture. And when you read about the rapture and the gathering of the saints together to go up and to meet the Lord in the air, the scriptures say, wherefore comfort one another with these words, right? It's a comfort to think about our, our gathering up to be together with the Lord uh, forever. Um, David talked about it in, in one of the, the famous Psalms, Psalm 23, where he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Um, when I think about the Lord's rod or the Lord's staff, sometimes I don't think of that as, as comfort. I, I, I'll bet if, if I asked my, my boys what they thought of my rod or my staff, uh, they might not think of it as a comfort. But David said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The Lord is a, is a strong tower. He's a fortress. He's a mighty defender. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him. So, so God is an ever-present help in trouble, and he offers that comfort through his Holy Spirit. And what a blessing we have through, through the Holy Ghost that has been given to us um, that is unlike 
any other time in the history of the world. When, when, when we think about the fact that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit who not only does all these things that we're going to get into, but beyond that, he also will never leave us. The Holy Spirit is with you forever. What a, what a joy that is, because who in here deserves that? Who in here has not grieved the Holy Spirit once uh, this past month or week or maybe this morning, right? Um, we grieve the Holy Spirit at times, and yet his promise is that he'll never leave us. And so what a blessing that is to know that not only do we have this, this comforter, uh, but he'll not, he'll not leave us or forsake us. So, all right, let's, let's jump right into some of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us. We'll go through uh, one, two, three, four, five things, five quick things that the Holy Spirit does for us. And we're going to find all of this except maybe two, two other places that we'll jump to. But for the, the rest of uh, Sunday school, we're going to stick primarily to the book of John. So if you'll find John chapter 14, and, we'll, and also we'll go to John 16, but you don't have to get that place just yet. If you can find John 14, I guarantee you'll very easily find John 16. <laughs> okay, I'll make it easy for you this morning. All right, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, John chapter 14, and let's uh, let's just read verse one real quick because, and then we'll jump down into it. So, John 14 verse one: Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God believe also in me. So there again, what a, what a comfort. Let not your heart be troubled, Christ is saying here. You believe in God, believe also in me. Look in verse 16. Jesus says, well, actually, let's look in verse 15, because that's the paragraph marker. Jesus says, if ye, if ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Okay, so he says there that you know the Holy Ghost because he, he dwelleth in you or with you and shall be in you, this Holy Ghost. And so, so he said, okay, so Christ... He came to earth, right? He was born as a baby. He grew up and became a man. He fulfilled his ministry. And there was a time when Christ said, I have to leave and I have to go to my father. And he says, and it's expedient for me to do that because if I don't go, the Holy Ghost won't come. But if I do go to my father, which is a good thing because the father's greater than I, then, my whole, then I will send my Holy Ghost. I will send the comforter and he will come to you he will be with you, and he will be in you. And then in the very next passage, verse 18, Christ says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So you scratch your head. You say, well, wait a minute, Lord. You said you're leaving, and you're going to send your Holy Ghost, and he'll come to us, and he'll abide with us, and he'll lead us and guide us into all truth, and he'll speak of those things that he hears of you. He won't speak his own. He'll only testify to the things that you have said. So you're leaving and he's coming. And then in the very next passage, you say, I'll not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So who, so are you coming back to me, Lord, or is the Holy Ghost coming back to me? Who, who comes back to, to us? Who, who comes to the believer? Who abides in you as a Christian? The Bible says that the God, that God the Father Jesus Christ, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost all abide in us. They, they make their abode with us. And so there again, you start to scratch your head and you go, well, which is it? And how's this all work? And again, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Okay, it's a mystery. It's a mystery, but God doesn't leave us. His Holy Spirit comes to us. In verse 19, yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me. Because I live, ye shall live also. And that day, or at that day, ye shall know that I am in, the, in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. All right, let's jump down to verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, 
which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. When you read the Bible and you study the scriptures and you have your quiet time with the Lord and you go through your daily Bible reading and you read the scriptures and then you leave and you go to your, your, your place of work or you go to school or you go to whatever you're doing that day. You go to the grocery store and something, something happens in, in your life or something, some situation that you find yourself in, a Bible verse comes to your mind and you go, where did that come from? It's the Holy Ghost that's bringing into remembrance all those things that Christ said to you, all those things that you read in the scripture. The Holy Spirit reminds you of that and, and, and teaches you that again. Um, you remember when Christ was talking to his disciples and he basically told them, listen, you guys are going to be in trouble here. I'm just I'm paraphrasing. Uh, they're going to take you. They're going to throw you in prison. They're going to beat you. He says they're going to bring you before the magistrate and before the judge. And he says, be careful not to rehearse anything, any answer of what you're going to say before they question you. And again, I'm paraphrasing. Don't, don't rehearse that because in that very hour, in that very moment, the Holy Ghost will give you the words to speak and will tell you what to say. And that's what we pray here uh, when, when, we, when we preach or when we go street preaching or when you maybe have an opportunity to witness to somebody. You say, Lord, give me the words to speak right now because I don't know what this person needs to hear, um, but you do. So give me the words to speak so that my witness is effective and that I have a, an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to help this person. Um, I thought I had the, the passage written down here. I don't, but it's basically, um, if anybody knows it, help, help me remember this, or maybe you can even find it for me, but where the scripture say, and I think it's in Luke where, where it says, I will give you a spirit that they will that the adversary will not be able to resist or gainsay. Basically, when you have that conversation, they won't be able to resist uh, what it is that I'm saying. And it's in it's in the book of Luke. I want to say it's chapter uh, maybe 21, but I can't remember for sure. Anyway, um, God gives us that power through His Holy Spirit. He reminds us and calls to remembrance those things which, which Christ uh, spoke and taught us of initially. Okay, so chapter tw or verse 16, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse 20, what, where'd we leave off? 26? Yeah, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So Christ says, I go away and I come again unto you. All right, John chapter 16, some more very, very good passages uh, concerning the Comforter and the Holy Spirit. And this really gets into my, my um, just a few small points here about what the Holy Ghost does for us, uh, what he does in general, what's his purpose, and what he does for the believer as he indwells um, the, the, the child of God. Okay, so John chapter 16, and we'll start in verse 5. The Bible says here, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Okay, so I had to look up that, that word reprove because we know that the Bible says in another place, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering, right? So a reprove is a little bit less than a rebuke, but it's still not a good thing, right? A re to be reproved is not good. To be reproved is to reprimand, um, to scold, to admonish, um, to upbraid. Remember, Christ upbraided the disciples for their lack of faith and for their unbelief. So the Holy Ghost will reprove. He'll, he'll admonish 
Uh, he'll scold. He'll upbraid the world of sin. Okay, so he brings that conviction. Didn't he bring that conviction to everyone in here the day that you got saved? You think about the preaching that you heard and you read through the word of God and some, some faithful uh, man or woman that was witnessing to you showed you what you are and who you are and you read it and saw it for yourself in the scriptures and who brought the conviction? The Holy Spirit brought that conviction. I'll, I'll never forget, this was one of the most, I would say probably one of the most powerful witnesses that, that I ever had. And I felt like I wasn't even doing good, but I was, I was talking to a person that was, in, that was sitting beside me in, in my work truck and uh, this was at Duquesne Light. This was years ago. We were sitting in the truck and I'm, I was just witnessing to him and just telling him about the scriptures and, and, and showing him some different things. And there was a point where he was, he was sitting beside me in the truck and he was sitting there with his, with his elbows on his knees and his head buried in his hands like this. And he was just like, just like panting, like huffing and puffing. And I thought, man, this guy is really under conviction. And um, he and the, the, the man did end up uh, getting saved, but the conviction was brought not, not from what I was saying, because again, I felt like I wasn't even really, I felt at the time like I wasn't really doing the greatest job, but the Holy Spirit was bringing that conviction, convicting the world of sin. And he convicted that, that man of, of his sin that day, uh, but also of righteousness and of judgment. And then he goes on to explain in verse nine, of sin, because they believe not on me. And the world doesn't believe on Christ these days. If you ask around and, and talk to people, um, pass out gospel tracts, whatever it, it might be, uh, you, you'll, you'll learn very quickly that the world does not believe on Christ. They don't. Uh, some, some people don't even, don't even know about him and, and don't even know the name and, and don't even understand the relevance or the point uh, that you're trying to make whenever you start talking about Christ. They believe not on me. Um, in verse 10 of righteousness, because I go to my father and ye see me no more and of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall not, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And so I wrote down three words here. Uh, guide, glorify, and give. So it's easy to, to remember. There are three G's. Guide, glorify, and give. This is what the Holy Spirit and, and the Spirit of truth, as he's called here in this passage, does. Look again in verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is our guide who leads us into all truth. As we read the scriptures and as you struggle to understand a passage and as, you know, in some cases you pray and ask before you even start, Lord, open up the scriptures to me. Open up my understanding so that I can figure out what it is you're trying to say here. Has anybody ever read a passage in the scriptures you just couldn't figure it out? <laughs> that's, that's like every time I read the Bible, I'm like, what is he talking about here? And I try to, you know, do the, the you know, hear a little there a little and run the references and compare spiritual with spiritual and compare scripture with scripture. And sometimes I'm further lost after I've done all that than when I, when I was when I first read the, the passage. Um, but the Holy Spirit sometimes, he, he guides you into that truth and you'll go back you know, maybe the next time you read that same passage, maybe 10 years later, and you'll, you'll look at it and you'll go, ah, I get it. Now I understand what I was struggling with so many years ago. Or in some cases, you'll read the exact same passage and you'll see something completely different than you, than you read the first time. Uh, that's the Holy Spirit that's guiding you into all truth. So he'll guide. Verse 14, he shall glorify me. So the Holy Spirit is not going to do anything that doesn't bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will glorify God. And when we pray, we pray in the Spirit. And when we worship, we worship in the Spirit. And, and we do those things in the Spirit, and it glorifies God. And sometimes we don't even do it because we don't know what to say, and we don't have the words to say. And the Spirit 
maketh groanings that cannot be uttered, right? He maketh intercession for the saints with groanings which cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit will take over when you're at a loss and you just, Lord, I don't even know what to say. I don't even, I'm just, I'm sorry, you know, whatever. And the, the Holy Spirit will take over and bring that uh, intercession before God. He intercedes for the, for the saints. Um, but he guides, he glorifies, he gives. And that's verse, uh, verse 15 where he gives. Uh, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore, I said, he shall take of mine, right? So the Holy Spirit takes of the Lord's and he shows it to us. So he's giving those things that, that belong to, to Christ and he's showing it to us unto us. It says, uh, all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. This is, these are things that the Holy Spirit does. A couple more quick things. He indwells the believer. He quickens the believer. He leads the believer. He bears witness with the believer. He helps the believer and he intercedes with the believer. And all of those things can be found in one chapter in, in the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter eight. And let's just go there real quick. We have, a, we have a little bit of time yet. Real quick, let's look at Romans chapter eight. I'm almost done here. I only really have a couple more passages to go to. So maybe two more after this indwells, quickens, leads, bears witness, helps, intercedes. Uh, these are the things that the Holy Ghost does for us uh, who are children of, of God. Uh, Romans chapter 8, let's look in verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay, so again, it goes back to, to people that you, that you talk to and, you know, everybody thinks their way is, is good enough and everybody has their own way. And who are you to tell me? Um, it's pretty plain that if, the, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay, uh, it, I don't know how you get around that. Well, you get around it through, through ignorance. People, they do err because they know not the scriptures, right? Um, you either have the spirit of Christ in this morning, you either have the spirit of Christ living in you, abiding in you and dwelling in you, or you don't. And if you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're, you don't belong to God. You're not God's. Um, and, and it's pretty plain when, when you read it that way. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. So when you think about the resurrection of the believer, when that, when that, when that saint of God dies to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But when God comes back, when Christ comes back to call out his own, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And it's the spirit of God that will quicken that person and will catch them up into the air to be with the Lord. And then we, which are alive, and I say we, we, which are, because we're all going to be here when the rapture happens, right? Amen. <laughs> we hope, I hope, I don't want to die. I'd rather get raptured out of here, to be honest with you. But when we, which are alive and remain, will be caught up into the Lord together to meet the, the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Uh, so the, the, the uh, Holy Spirit indwells the believer, right? We're not in the flesh. We're in the spirit. It quickens our mortal bodies. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, in verse 12, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Um, for, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So that's another thing that the Spirit does. It bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Look down in verse 22. We'll read just a few more passages. Uh, in verse 22, same chapter. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. 
And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Uh, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So the Spirit intercedes for us uh, according to the will of God. And I guess I, I guess I got to read verse 28 too. And we know that all things, work, can't, can't get all the way to verse 28 and stop, right? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So there's, in, in just in that chapter, Romans chapter eight, we see where the spirit indwells, quickens, leads, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, okay? He bears witness, uh, helps, and he intercedes on behalf of the saints. And now, in closing, the, the last two verses, and you don't even have to turn there. I'll make it easy for you. Um, I'll turn there. The last two things, and these things are, are, again, it just goes back to when you think about the mercy of God and how his mercy endureth forever, and you, you read those, those passages that talk about that. Um, the fact that he will never leave us. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So you're sealed all the way till the day of redemption, which means, Christian, you can't lose your salvation, right? You are sealed all the way till that very end. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That work is the work of the Holy Ghost. Uh, within the believers. And, and we already read this passage. It says, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he, he may abide with you for ever. Okay? He'll never leave. Um, and, and the last passage, I'll, I'll just read this. Uh, the Holy Spirit, and, and this, is, this is one that Pastor Jim would go to a lot too, and, and he really liked it, and, and so do I. But it's Ephesians chapter one. You don't have to turn there. The Holy Ghost does seal us and it says that in whom ye also trusted. Okay, so you trust Christ. After that, ye heard the word of truth. Somebody preached to you the word of truth and you trusted Christ. Okay, after that, ye heard that word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed in Christ, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That's a lot of words there. And you go, what does, what does that all mean? Uh, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. That, that means that we're bought, right? He purchased us and the Holy Spirit that he put in us is the down payment. And that's what Pastor Jim would always say. He put a deposit on us. We belong to him. We're, we're owned of the Lord. And, uh, and, and he will be in us uh, until the redemption of the purchased possession when we get called out to, to meet the Lord in the air. So those are things that the Holy Spirit does for us. I, I just wanted to get a little bit further into that because when, you, when I read that and was studying it, you know, it's just, it's a joy. It's a blessing that we have the Spirit of God that, uh, that never leaves us and helps us and does all those things for us. So um, I don't know where pastor's going to pick up. He actually said about about, you know, well, maybe you should jump right into the rapture and get into that since that's the next sequence. And maybe I'll, he, he can jump into that since I, I stole some of his uh, content uh, to use for my Sunday school message and teaching on the Holy Ghost.